First of all, let me extend my welcome also to all of you at uh, our Kroger user conference. It's fantastic to see the growth and have all of you here. Before I uh, started the keynote, I wanted to make a uh, special introduction. It's a special pleasure for me to have my father here in the room. My father is the original co-founder, uh, the original founder of Elite. He and I have worked together my entire career. He's a investor, he's on the board at ProRiver, he's a core part of the company, and it's uh, wonderful to have him here. Ed Murray in the room here at Boston. Yeah. Federal prosecutors 
ended up recommending 33 months in prison. <coughs> On the right, you see a picture of one of the most famous technology executives in the industry. His name is Mark Hurd, former CEO of Hewlett Packard. Mr. Hurd was forced to resign last year. The reason? Improper reporting of $7,500 on his expense reports. Now, the year before, 2009, Mr. Hurd earned $24.2 million. $7,500 represents 0.03% of his prior year's earnings. You have to ask yourself, what were they? Many of us in the room here work in the law firm and professional services industry. And it turns out that we are not immune from this phenomenon either. This year, we heard the story of Christopher Grierson. Mr. Grierson was one of the top litigators at Hogan Laws. He worked on some of the most famous high-profile cases, representing the Bank of England and the Sultan of Brunei. He sat on the management committee of the firm, and he lost his position after he was discovered with fraudulent expense reports. His annual earnings were estimated to be about 830,000 pounds per year. Samuel Fishman was a partner in 2008. He pleaded guilty to submitting improper expense reports totaling about $300,000. Mr. Fishman was sentenced to 15 months in prison, fines, probation, and restitution. He was disbarred. In 2008, the American lawyer reported that profits per equity partner were approximately $2.25 million per year. Many, many times the amount of all the expense reporting of proprietors. On the right, you see a picture of Carlos Spinella Nosa, a young partner for about five years at Sullivan Cromwell, in charge of their South American practice. He was caught billing clients for first-class travel flying economy and pocketing the difference. He built his personal meals and entertainment to the firm and called it business development. He even submitted false expense reports on behalf of an associate and gave an associate a cut of the proceeds. The result it was for, that for approximately $500,000 in fraudulent claims, Mr. Nosada lost his job, was disbarred, faced prison time. At the time his actions were uncovered, Sullivan and Cromwell reported profits per partner of $3 million per year. Step back again one more time and say, what were they thinking? How could these people with fantastic, successful careers, earning vast sums of money, lose it all for what seems like relatively small improprieties world of expense reporting. So I would like to share with you some theories on this. The first theory is these people are ethically challenged. <laughs> but in fact, I would like to reject that. Because I don't think cheating on your expense reports is a question of ethics. An ethical question is something that you need to make as an individual. You have to determine if something is right or wrong. We might say there's an ethical question if you suspect one of your colleagues of cheating on expense reports. And maybe you have a question should you inform the company or not inform the company on the potential of the property. But when you yourself cheat, I don't think that's an ethical question. If you have a clear code formulated by your firm or your company, you have no choices. You have a directive telling you what is expected behavior on your expense reports. It's not a gray area. It's really a black and white area. So I think we'll reject the ethically challenged theory. Theory number two 
is based on a famous article by a Harvard psychologist named G. W. Ainsley in the Journal of Experimental Analysis of Behavior. I'll quote, Pigeons were given a small, immediate food reinforcement for pecking a key, and a larger, delayed reinforcement for not pecking this key. In 95% of the trials, the majority of pigeons went for the short-term gain. So theory number two is that somehow pigeon brains are wired for short-term gain instead of long-term gain. But I think there's two problems with theory number two. The first theory is I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that lawyers and pigeons have anything in common. <laughs> the second thing is that in our case, it doesn't really seem a question of short-term gain versus long-term gain. What it seems to be is a question of short-term gain versus disastrous long-term consequences. It doesn't seem that the pigeon theory is going to solve our question of what were they thinking. So theory number three and the theory that I'm going to stick with is based on what's called the psychology of irrationality. We know that people are often irrational. We choose self-defeating behaviors where the eventual cost outweighs any potential short-term gain. We can look around ourselves and see regular cases where people behave irrationally. They have excessive eating. They drink beyond to the point of intoxication. They enjoy chemical euphorias. Or perhaps the most classic case of all, cigarette smoking. And in all of these cases, people behave irrationally, choosing short-term gain for often disastrous long-term consequences. So why is it? Why do people do that? I think the psychology literature has given us a really interesting insight. It turns out that to understand self-control, you want to think of it as a muscle. It's analogous to a physical muscle. We all have the self-control muscle. Human beings could not survive if we didn't have it. Ancient humans had to remember that if they ate all of the seeds from this year's harvest, there would be nothing to plant and eat next year. So we all have the muscle, but the problem is if you use it too much, it gets tired. So let's look at what causes the self-control muscle to get tired. The first thing is that it can get tired from both physical and emotional exhaustion. Turns out that people who are upset fail to think through implications. Psychologists in one experiment made people angry, and then they gave them a choice between two bets a poor bet and a much smarter bet. The angry people consistently chose poorly. If you forced one group to stop for a minute, think, write down the pros and cons, just that brief interruption made a huge difference, and that group always chose more wisely. It turns out that emotional upset weakens the self-control muscle. Fatigue, physical fatigue, can also tire the emotional, the self-control muscle. It turns out that late evening is a time when most people break their diets, when they drink most heavily. If you look at studies, most impulsive and violent crimes are committed between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. when self-control is at its weakest. What's interesting, though, is that also self-control itself seems to weaken the muscle. If you use all of your resources to meet a deadline, maintain a diet, stop smoking, it exhausts the muscle. Too much self-control can 
wear you down. I'd like to share another fascinating implication of the muscle model. It turns out when a muscle is depleted, it seems like all self-control is abandoned. Self-control, once abandoned, doesn't seem to be subject to further consideration. So let's think about it again in the diet analogy that we can all identify with. A dieter is thinking about a really tempting dessert. They're coming up with a rationalization. Maybe the hostess baked it will be insulted if you don't eat it. But once you start, what are you likely to say? You're likely to say to yourself, what the hell? I've blown it, so I might as well eat the whole darn thing. There are very few people that will succumb to just one bite of that piece of cake. For us, it means that an initial loss of self-control can mean an ongoing series of bad choices are, will be made. It's an important implication for those of us in the room here. So let's understand the implications of the theory of the muscle model of self-control. I think we just step back and know that we should carefully audit anybody who is stressed out and just lost weight. That's an obvious implication <laughs> of the rules here. And maybe we can come up with a more generalized model to help you do your audit. One of the implications is that self-control is hard. Even good people can lose it when that self-control muscle is exhausted. You can think of it this way. Our job is more than just being a cop. The job for all of us in the room here today is helping people maintain this self-control. It turns out that it's particularly easy to lose self-control when you have nice, tempting rationalizations sitting there. In a study of expense control fraud, it turns out that people easily find rationalizations. Everybody thinks that they should be compensated a little bit extra for the inconveniences of business travel. Everybody <coughs> feels that there was an expense that they weren't properly reimbursed for and they're out of pocket for some of their money. People feel that expense policies might be unfair. Given those rationalizations, a weakened self-control muscle, it's easy to make a mistake. So from our standpoint, I think it's much better to avoid temptation than to overcome it. We need to build the rules and processes that prevent people from making mistakes. You don't bake brownies, make a beautiful meal in a house while somebody's on a diet. You don't make, you open the windows if you're gonna do it. So that's our job, by visibly having an aggressive expense reporting system with thorough auditing, you are in fact removing it. Let's start at looking at some obvious strategies on how to do this. Number one, we ought to be looking for easy loopholes. Let me redeem the reputation of lawyers, perhaps, with an accountant story. <laughs> Andrew Weatherall was director of KPMG Worldwide. He sat on the management committee of the firm. He was a senior member of their organization. Last year, the story was uncovered that he had committed expense report fraud for about 500,000 500, pounds. How did he do it? He kept his fraudulent claims just under the 5,000 pound limit that would have required higher approval. I'd like to quote to you an article from the Daily Mail, one of the newspapers there. Quote, once he started stealing, it became easier and easier as there were few controls or restrictions on him, and he became cavalier in his approach. And Mr. Weatherall, it turns out, was sentenced to four years in prison. I'll give you another example on a strategy that just seems so obvious. When we look back at the Parliament stand scandal, Sir Alan Hazelhurst was Deputy Speaker of the House. For four years, he submitted a monthly gardening expense of 
2,649 pounds, totaling about 12,000 pounds in total. Now you can imagine what was the limit on requiring receipts? 250 pounds. For 12 years, every month, he turned in a 249-pound claim. So the first and obvious strategy is look for the basic, simple things that people might do when they're subject to temptation. This area of financial fraud has gained tremendous interest from the U.S. government recently and has been the subject of a lot of work from the FBI Counterterrorism Division. So in a relatively interesting article, it's interesting as we get a expense reporting fraud, they wrote a number of strategies on how you can find fraud. The first thing they recommend is use analytics. Look at the numbers, not just in bulk, but from a statistical perspective. For example, if any of you remember your basic statistics, a three standard deviations would cover close to 99% of all normal expected behavior. Think of it this way. Look for transactions way at the end of the bell curve. And you see those, those are certainly worth auditing. Number two, timing. Look for things that are done on weekends, strange times. Perhaps our theory is you should look at expense reports submitted between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> Number three, look for transactions, the obvious ones that we just discussed, transactions just below the thresholds. Look at your own reporting and routing rules. Look at the numbers that you know, would require somebody to would avoid a, a secondary routing. Look at the numbers just below where you require receipts. Number four, receipts themselves are increasingly hard to use as a documentary evidence. If any of you have spent even a little bit of time on uh, Photoshop, you realize that it's almost impossible to tell whether you're looking at an original receipt or something that's been doctored. So wherever possible, switch to company credit cards. The company credit card provides something that's an electronic record that's protected by our system and can't be doctored by people. We certainly require it for entertainment and other areas that are particularly subject to fraud. And number five, I think the subject of airline tickets today is probably one of the most tempting of all areas. A few years ago, Internal Auditor Magazine reported a classic fraud scenario where you book a ticket for, a, for travel well in advance at a low rate, and you book the same ticket right before the trip at a very expensive rate. Right? You submit the documentation for the expensive rate and you travel on the inexpensive ticket and then claim the credit. You think this is theoretical. If you go back to the lawyer stories we had at the beginning, Mr. Christopher Grierson from Hogan Lovells turned in 5,000 pounds a week of airline expenses where he took the refund on his personal credit. It's a particularly tempting area. There's another implication, interesting implication from our theory of the self-control muscle. Many firms have a policy, they call it their zero tolerance policy. It's part of their expense reporting system. It says that one mistake, if you're caught making a mistake, then you're subject to immediate dismissal. The question is, is that policy self-defeating or not? It can turn an initial lapse into an absolute catastrophe. The analogy you might say, let's use a military analogy, where you put all of your troops on the front line it's a fantastic front line, but in the event that it is breached, you have absolutely no reserves. People say to themselves, I've made the mistake, what's the point of any further self-control? So it may be that understanding a small indiscretion is a better strategy for reducing fraud or eliminating it than a strategy of zero tolerance. 
Let's summarize what we learned. I start off by saying, what were they thinking? And I think we now know the answer to that is, they weren't thinking. The self-control muscle had been exhausted for one reason or another, and they made huge mistakes. We are in the business of protecting people from themselves. We're not trying to protect ethical failings. We're trying to protect people from human failings. It's our job to do our best to remove the temptation. And I believe you have no better tool than Crow River to help people help themselves. I hope you enjoy this conference. And I hope you circulate and find strategies that will help you help people help themselves. Thank you very much.